Hello everyone, welcome to the new video on my channel. Last time I promised you the game played with white pieces and a better overall chess level. Did I keep my promise? Let's find out. Alright, so as you may observe as early as now, uh, I kept my promise in terms of showing you a game from white's perspective after few games played with black pieces, but will it be of a high chess level? I'm not sure. <laughs> so, uh, let's start. My opponent opted for the delayed Arapin variation against the Sicilian defense. It's quite a flexible setup that I recommend usually when there is uh, someone that don't want to learn a lot of theory in Sicilian, because if you go for the open Sicilian, you may be met with many, many different variations, uh, most of them being sharp ones. So you have the Nidorf, the Dragon, the Classical, the Scheveningen and stuff like that. So there is a lot to cover. So when you want to go away from all this theory, you can just push C3 with the idea of D4, right? As in the Alap in, in general. So there is a nice trick in here executed with the H3 move because the pawn on E4 cannot be taken. Why? Well, the guy rated 1750 learned it the hard way because he took this pawn. And then after queen a4 check, the knight was gone. So what do you say? Do we finish the video here? No, no, no. I will try to cover one more game, obviously. But what I wanted to say is that um, even at this level, the blunders like that happen. The key thing to take away from it is that all you need to do is try to learn from your own mistakes and don't ever repeat the same mistakes again. If that's the case, then you will progress, don't worry. I just wanted to show you guys that um, having an 1800 rating on rapidonchess.com does not mean that you are the god of chess. And also it's the level that many of you can still accomplish, so just keep working and that's the case. Anyway. Uh, I will just show the game in between while I'm talking. So the idea is that I believe the biggest difference between the 1800 rated player and the other ratings that we've already covered during the previous episodes is that at this point you should have the opening that you normally choose. You should know the ideas in it so that you are always around the, you play always the stuff that you more or less know about and therefore you can use the important time for the later stages of the game. Not only that, you should not blunder a lot. I mean, obviously in this game there was a blunder right at the beginning, but it was mostly because uh, of an opening trap. But as you may observe, while I'm moving the pieces, there were not so many blunders during the game. So that's the other step. And also I believe that what makes a difference between the 1600 and um, 1800 rating is that at this level you should know more and more about the strategy in general so until the previous episode we were talking mostly about the tactics i believe that from this point onwards we will try to also cover some strat strategy topics because that's what i believe make people better at this level allow them to progress because as i've said if you don't blunder a lot if you know your opening, well, how then can you win or lose a game with the deeper understanding of chess? So hopefully we will see that in the coming game. So stay tuned for it. All right, so yet again, black pieces. Sorry for that. Um, but really, it's just uh, luck, you know, 50-50 chance of of the uh, which color to choose. And I chose black most of the time. So. I kept my promise, I, show, I showed you the game from the white's perspective, so I have nothing to accuse me of anything, and I can just talk you through the game. So, as I've mentioned during the talk one minute ago, at this level you should uh, know your opening, so my student likes the Karakan opening very much, and he opts for the... I mean, not he, but the opponent opts for the exchange variation. And in here, we discussed that it's useful to 
develop the knight from g8 first, not b8, because then you might end up being uh, pinned in some variations, which you may not like, and therefore knight f6 is more flexible for you, and only after bishop is on d3 then you may try to develop the knight to c6, because the pin is no longer a threat, because it would mean that white loses a tempo. Not only that, you should try to fight for the center with the bishop g4 move is al if allowed, because usually white should try to play a move like h3, covering the g4 square, bishop is covering the f5 square, and our bishop would be uh, perhaps bad in here, but if we are allowed to do so, we may develop the bishop, putting pressure to the center, and after c3, e6, if we are allowed, we would like to place the bishop on d6, because we have the reverse Carlsbad structure, as I've said, we will talk a little bit more about strategy, and it means that in this structure, both bishops on d3 and d6 are very good ones, and if we are allowed to place it there, we would do so. So knight b to d2 I consider an inaccuracy, because it makes this bishop a very weak piece, and our bishop a very good one. So if you know the opening, the theory behind it, and the ideas behind it, you may end up in such situation that white may not even consider a worse one, because they just don't know the theory, and they just play by heart, and they think, okay, I'm good, whatever. But if you dig really deep into the position, you will know that in this instance, because of this weak bishop, because of this good one, because of this one being developed, not stuck here, black is perhaps already better, and we will be happy to deliver the minority attack on the queen side, which is the common theme in the Carlsbad structure, the normal one and the reversed one, and in the very reversed one we will do it. What does it mean? In general, in such structure, black is uh, aiming to deliver the attack on the queen side with pawns, so we have two pawns against three, one, uh, three pawns, so it means that we have the minority there, but we st are still attacking, that's why it's the name, minority attack. And the idea is to perhaps try to uh, create a weakness on c3. Let's say white played here, rook b8, I don't know, knight f1, b5, uh, here, let's exchange, let's play bishop e3, b4, and in long term we will try to create this weakness, so that in the later stages of the game we have the aim to look at, and uh, we don't have any weaknesses, right? So that's the case. Anyway, that just that's just a short introduction to the strategy of the Carlsbad structure in general, however, it's not what will happen in the game. In the game, because the white pieces are so not coordinated, opponent opted for the idea of playing queen b3 followed by c4, which is already a bad thing to do. It allows black to take on c4 immediately, creating an isolated pawn, and as we know, yet again another strategical, another strategical point of mine is that uh, in the isolated pawn, white is the one that should go for the initiative, for the activity, because that's what the isolated pawn should guarantee us. However, in that instance, because white is so underdeveloped and the knight cannot recapture the pawn because of this problem, etc., white will still be stuck in terms of the knight placement, the bishop placement, so the isolated pawn itself does not allow white to gain the initiative, gain the activity and so on, and itself the isolated pawn might become a weakness shortly, so that's why I very much dislike the c4 idea in this instance, and as I've said at this point, uh, white should try to make up for the mis early mistakes and perhaps uh, maneuver this knight somewhere, try to open up this bishop, etc. Queen b3 and c4 was not the case. However, even though my student played perfectly the opening, knew the rules, the structure and what to do in it, basically, we've never discussed, discussed c4. Uh, I mean, it's no surprise, it's not a great move, right? However, at this level still, you may know your opening great, you may know the structures great, ideas, all the good stuff, but if opponent plays differently, you may not be able to define how should you react. And basically, this is the easiest reaction in the world. Just take the pawn and be happy about playing against isolated pawn in a good manner. 
Uh, my student went for b6, trying to cover up the c5 square so that c5 is no longer possible, but instead of doing that, you could have just taken the pawn, right? And the result would be the same, the bishop on d6 would not be bothered. Anyway, after b6, we will witness a blunder, yet another one, knight e5. Knight e5 is bad on so many levels, at this level, that I don't really want to dig too deep into it, but the biggest problem with that move is that the pawn on d3 is totally without any defense, right? So at this moment the pawn on d4 is all right. And at this moment it can just be taken and then the knight is lost and, and the game is over basically. But it happened that my student didn't go for the d4 pawn but rather the e5 pawn, meaning that he firstly exchanged the pieces there and then grabbed the pawn because, well, you know, who can refuse a free pawn, right? So that's, uh, that's that. Anyway, after a few more exchanges, etc., we ended up in such position, and I consider this a good result out of the opening, right, since my student, thanks to the good preparation and understanding of the structure, got himself a pawn advantage without much effort playing black pieces. So I would say that's a good result, right? So let's see how the game continues. So after claiming the advantage, my student just went away from the pressure on d5 square with knight f6, now went away from the pressure on the e5 square with bishop d6 and now defended the f6 square with bishop e7. Is it a good sequence? I'm not sure about going back so much, you know, when you have the pawn advantage, when you are better side, you don't really want to just go back to the defense. So this whole sequence is not the best of all, I would say. Perhaps just simple bishop f6 would have done the work with the idea that we still maintain the pressure to b2 pawn, so that this bishop cannot really move. Uh, after grabbing the knight on d5, obviously we would recapture with the rook, introducing the other one to the game and not creating the isolated pawn for ourselves. And then we can just still continue being uh, a side with one more pawn and more active pieces. At this point I'm not sure about the position anymore. I mean, obviously we have one more pawn, but without the activity we are kind of worse here strategically because the bishop pair is usually very good in such instance so that's what happened rook c1 bishop b1 so the bishop are just annoying right so strat strategically at this point as i've said after the many exchanges that happened at this point you should reevaluate the position the situation take a dig deep breathe in breathe out and then decide uh, how would you like to uh, make this advantage work for you. In this uh, situation, I'm not sure if this pawn guarantees us so many ways to win the game, right? However, what happened then is yet another blunder. That I'm not sure if there are more blunders in this game or in the previous episodes. Let me know in the comments. But in here, Queen b5 was played obviously for the b2 pawn, but also the g5 bishop, right? So the bishop is gone. Bam, like that. So yeah, I'm not sure about the blunders at this level. I hoped to see more. I promised you the higher level, but I'm not sure if I uh, deliver it. I mean, I try to deliver the better level with the explanations, but players, I'm not sure if they do so. Anyway, the game continued in a way that I don't like from the Black's perspective, meaning that you have the, if you have the advantage, you should just try to play it simple use this advantage to win the game and, you know, start a new one. Instead, my student went for some fireworks because right now the bishop is attacked, he went for the bishop d4. Okay, I mean, tactically it's sound and it's working because the bishop is under the attack, but also the rook is not protected. And if the rook takes hours, then the bishop goes away from the attack. Perfect, but I have this theory that whenever we are so much better, we don't have to complicate things at all for us, so instead of doing that we could have just retreat to e7 with the bishop or, or maybe place the bishop on d4 or do something else just to not create too much tension in the position because that's not what we wish to happen. We would like to keep the tension low, exchange the pieces and win smoothly without any ad uh, adventures. So even though in here there is like no problem with it, if you continue playing that way you may end up in trouble. And uh, that's why I was trying to refer to, you don't have to really 
put everything still to the one gear which is forward 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 you can just calm down and be all right with it because at this point because of your three last moves you need to find the best option to still maintain the big initiative and big advantage that you have and this move would be queen g6 you are covering the checkmate and if the bishop is gone this one also be gone but it may not be the easiest tactic to to see mostly because queen g6 not only goes under the attack of the queen but also this bishop but this time the rentgen the x-ray works uh, for our side more but still it's kind of risky that's why my student didn't play it and instead went for the bishop f2 and queen f4 all right now you are exchanging pieces but why did you have to lose a bishop advantage in order to really start thinking about exchanging and making things more relaxed and more calm right you could have done it earlier so that's my that's the lesson i would like you all guys to to learn anyway the position is still obviously very much uh, winning this move is yet again a not uh, good one i mean obviously white was trying to protect the bishop because if the bishop goes somewhere black may try to deliver this check maybe grab this pawn but still the a3 pawn is gone anyway if black really wants to take it uh, in this variation i mean because rook c3 is still working right so this move does not work does not help with it and in that way you are putting yourself into the pin and black has all the time in the world yet again i will refer to the patience right because there is the pin and because we have two more pawns we can just call me play whatever we want obviously there is a trick involved which is bishop h7 check and grabbing the rook my opponent saw that played g6 and from this point onwards you don't have to rush anything yet again as we've discussed in many previous episodes in here you have all the time in the world to just make your position better right so what black is lacking not much maybe just the king activity so let's do it let's just play king f8 king e7 king d6 what else well maybe we would like to place the pawns on the dark square so that the bishop cannot attack them okay maybe f6 maybe e5 right what then okay maybe then only then i will try to exchange something in the center okay so playing i don't know like rook c3 with the idea of taking the pawn on knight c3 check with the idea of other checks and grabbing the pawns or exchanging pieces etc and my student rushed things a little bit too early because because he went for knight c3 check immediately knight b5 with the pressure to a4 a3 pawn and check fork exchange and a position like this you could have had a very similar position but with king on e7 pawn on f6 maybe pawn on f5 with all the moves that you could have done in between just waiting for the opponent to to do nothing basically because there was nothing to be done from the opponent's perspective so that will that is what i would like you to yet again learn to stick into your mind is that you need to have more patience especially in the end games right because what i mean is that in here this is our biggest advantage perfect what is our biggest weakness still this king this king is much more active and if we allow it somehow to go there we may experience some difficulties in winning the position and what i'm trying to say is that at this level you still may not know the end games the rook end games very well because they are the most complicated ones out of all the end games and it's not clear whether or not at this level you were you had time to study it study those therefore instead of going into them you could have just operate on different ways to win the game in here if you don't know the rook end games and if you don't care about the king act activity you might actually end up in a little bit of trouble trouble why my student play rook d3 check then we went back to d8 then went to d7 then to d4 like what are all those moves we are wasting all the precious tempos on doing i'm not sh even sure what and what for like what's the case what's the end product i'm not sure what's the idea behind the, the behind it right so this game was won by my student not because of the rook end game knowledge but because of the two pawn advantage two pawns advantage but if we just gave one additional pawn to white let's say on f2 this position position is not so clear who is winning anymore 
because the king is active, because the pawns are pushing, uh, and we have difficulties on the queen side. The only thing that will save us is that indeed there is no pawn on f2, therefore our e pawn is even faster than the white pawns on the queen side, right? So instead of doing that, first of all, yet again I will come back to this situation, this position. In here you just could have done many more things before you rush for the win. And not only that, in here you still should have an idea what to do. So I would say if you are not really familiar familiar with rook endgames, you are not happy with playing those, you are scared and stuff like that, you can just play rook d7 in one move, not like three or four moves, and then start pushing the pawns with the king, allowing the opponent to try to create initiative on the king side, queen side, sorry, but with this rook protecting the pawn, prote pawn protecting the other one, you should be fine for at least five to seven moves. And it's enough for you to just start your initiative on the king side and win the game, right? Those many lost tempos may backfire with uh, having difficulties uh, to win the game. And uh, I believe that at this point, white could have tried a move like a5. Why? Because after rook takes before a6 might be played. And now you see what's the problem, right? The pawn is so close to the promotion square and we don't have too many ways to really control it. So yeah, that's the problem. And if you would like to exchange, then there is another problem of yet again pawn being advanced, pawn being attacked and stuff like that. So as I've said, the only thing that is saving us and will allow us to win the game is that there is no additional pawn for the opponent. So if we had just one more pawn because of the F2 pawn being there, we would be on the verge of losing the game basically because then we would have to play a f5 and then try to let's say create a passed pawn while white is on the verge of creating a passed pawn grabbing the a pawn promoting to the queen right so i'm trying to say that in general at this level you may lack the understanding of the end games in general but mostly rook end games so instead of going into those when having such an uh, advantage you should try to win the game with other ways than the rook end games i'm not sure if i'm clear but I hope you get my point. Anyway, in the game, white didn't went for the a5, therefore allowed us to place this rook finally on d7 with this whole setup I've mentioned before. And only now e5, f5 was played and we have an easy win. But at what cost? We could have won this game much easier, much easier, much earlier. So why do it to ourselves, you know? So yeah, um, the following moves are irrelevant we are winning in many ways however at the very end of the line in here things might have gotten a little bit more scary because the pawn is not far from prom promotion our rook is kind of blocked so how to win it the easiest way would be obviously to just push the f pawn because after losing e2 pawn we can promote here but my student went for the other line and i hope i really hope and pray that he had everything calculated because he went for the slower version of winning but and even better maybe so if he had calculated everything perfect if he hadn't i'm not so happy <laughs> anyway he went for the classic setup in the rook end games which is pawn protects pawn and the pawn protects the f1 square i mean the pawn in front of him so our rook can go there trying to uh, kick away the rook from e1 that's what happened and the idea is that even though white is on time to promote he will not be on time to keep the queen because after king moves you can deliver another check grab the queen and then promote two queens instead of one so i guess that's what uh, why i've said that uh, it's the best line but a little bit i was a little bit scared that my student was not calculating it until the end but anyway that's not relevant to the video uh, I hope you liked it, this one, because there were two games involved in uh, one video, so I hope you learned from both of those. And yet again, the lesson is that you don't have to worry that much about blundering at the early stages of your uh, chess journey, because as you can see, even at the much higher level, there are plenty of blunders. So with that note, with that point, uh, let's jump into the outro. All right, so that's the game. I hope you liked this episode, uh, leave a like and comment, you may comment on my jokes, on my 
voice on my chess level on anything you wish we will have two more episodes in this playlist the games will be of higher level i can guarantee it now so i will not fool you anymore i promise <laughs> and um i cannot promise though that they will be played with white pieces i'm sorry about it but it's just how it uh, all you know turned out to be but anyway the games will be instructive so stay tuned for them and uh, see you soon shortly bye